I told my, my partner, Brooke, who's now my wife, that I was going through this and she said, I know, <laughs> I live with you, I, I can see this every day. And it wasn't until she said that she'd go to work and go to work and be anxious all day that she'd come home and I wouldn't be alive anymore. And she'd walk in and I'd be in the exact same spot on the couch that I was um, when she left at eight o'clock in the morning. It wasn't really to hearing that and then seeing my parents after telling them uh, what was going on, how upset they both were. Dad's pretty um, solid, stoic, doesn't show a lot of emotion and, and he was crying. And seeing that, the impact was like, bloody hell, I'm, I'm in a really average spot and, and really need to, to do something about it. That's Zane Kirkwood. He's a new dad, a husband, and one of the most decorated Sandville State League footy players of all time. Zane's also a big mental health advocate because he's lived with varying degrees of anxiety and depression throughout his life and knows the toll it can take. An anxious lad from a young age, Zane found space to breathe out on the footy field until panic attacks threatened to take that away. Zane was a textbook example of how hiding the way we're really feeling can lead down a dark path, and thankfully, he's since been on a much brighter one, and that's mostly down to him. Welcome to Young Blood, the award-winning volunteer podcast dedicated to young men's mental health. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is a platform for everyday men to share lived experience stories and show that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. Suicide is the number one killer of young people and changing that starts with speaking up. So let's do it. This episode has been made possible by Pro Realty Property Consultants. Pro Realty is a proud sponsor of the Young Blood Men's Mental Health podcast and a big believer in the importance of mental health awareness and suicide prevention. These legends swooped in with funding support at a time when we really needed it and it's thanks to them we've been able to keep the show going. If you're looking for a commercial real estate agency you can trust to deliver quality, Pro Realty has a team of experienced professionals with the knowledge and expertise to provide you with a wide range of specialist services. Get in touch with their friendly team today to discuss how they can best assist you and mention Youngblood in your inquiry for a discount. Trigger warning, if you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Zane, how do you put into words what it's like to have a panic attack? Intense, um, unknown, uh, scary. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty scary. That's probably the, the one that stands out to me now. It's, yeah, everything just goes pretty, for me, it goes pretty numb and pretty dark and um, uncontrollable sort of thing. And yeah, unknown of when it's going to end and um, how, how it started and how it's going to finish sort of thing. So yeah, probably scary is probably the, the word that stands out. Um, what do you remember about your first one? I think just how much my body locked up and how much I couldn't control my, my, my limbs and my body and how sick I felt. And just short of breath, and not not I guess not knowing what was actually happening. I remember speaking to mum. It wasn't my first one, but one that my mum first witnessed, and she thought I was having a seizure because I'd just locked up and my arms and legs were shaking, and I couldn't control, couldn't talk. And yeah, I guess hearing that back was pretty pretty scary to hear what it looks like, but then knowing what you're feeling as well was was pretty daunting and pretty scary. So yeah, it's probably the word that stands out now. I think about it. Yeah. And you know what's behind panic attacks now? Like I'm sure you've done a, a fair yeah. bit of research into it. Yeah, and and I think learning f for me in particular, like yeah, obviously learning what's the generic and uh, what's behind it, but then learning what the cues are for myself and picking up those signs early and, and trying to catch them before it becomes um, a panic attack and putting things in place to yeah not let a full on panic attack occur and, and try and catch it before it becomes um, something like that, which is not always easy. Yeah. I guess the more you, you practice those things, the easier it becomes, like your breathing techniques and different things like that. So yeah. How much was that happening when you were really struggling? Quite regularly. <laughs> I'd look back and try and block it out, I guess at that time, but yeah, it would be weekly occurrences of, of that. And um, yeah, and it could be a variety of different reasons of why that would, it would kick off. Yeah. Could be, going to the shops. Um, I had one at Marion one day when I felt like I was improving um, and me and my partner, uh, Brooke, we, we thought we'd, we'd test the waters and I lasted five minutes and was having a panic attack um, up in just walking the shops because I thought these people were looking at me. So yeah, and then it happens at home behind closed doors as well. So it's a, a variety of different things. Is that related to the stimulus that's going on? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think just f for me, the yeah, I really struggle with, I guess, the social anxiety and, and, and uh, I guess people feel like that person over there is looking at me and talking about me or judging me or something like that, which 
they got a lot better things to do than worry about that. But yeah, I'd often just sit on my phone, not even actually look at what I'm look um, on my phone, but just to distract myself, sort of thing, and just try and get through that period. Um, Could you feel it coming on? Yeah, yeah, like I'd get tingling in my feet and my arms, and I could feel my my breathing change, and yeah, get like a bit of a tingle in in like different parts of my body, like my head or something like that, and you could just feel that tension rising sort of thing and yeah would just I'd try and do things to to stop that coming on but yeah the times you couldn't catch it in time and unfortunately it would happen um I had it, one drive, you sort of feel like you were waiting for it to happen as well yeah time. yeah I had one day where I was driving to footy and I'd wake up and I wasn't having a good day and and I knew that so I'd, my plan was just to get through the day and um, get to footy training and then I'd feel better and I was driving and had, I guess, tunnel vision, which was not abnormal for, I guess, having a, a an average day and got a phone call and didn't go so well. And that started a, a panic attack as I was driving um, the same road that I would to footy training. And I didn't know where I was and had to call the, once I uh, I pulled over and then I had someone walk past who I didn't know and they tapped on the window and said, are you okay? And um, they helped me out and they called the head trainer for the footy and he came and got me and took me home and had to go pick my car up the next day and had no idea where I was. That was a particularly significant one. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Yeah. And that was probably right in the middle of a, a pretty tough year um, for myself. But yeah, good learnings again from that as well of voicing how I was feeling at that time and that day to, to the appropriate people and just to get a little bit of support and maybe just some... some uh, some help from them just to get through and then yeah. the panic attacks were pretty far along on your mental health journey yeah like what have you been experiencing long before that you know since primary school was i experiencing them like, no what were you experiencing like leading um, up to that? yeah i guess that like i did looking back i guess going back to primary school i was having panic attacks um, but i didn't know that was what it was i was a very i guess emotional young fella and would yeah get quite upset over little things and get quite distraught and just withdrawn from things that I remember not eating and having that I guess that really tight stomach feeling um that's how I described it when I was um, in primary school and would stop doing things that I enjoyed like footy and yeah I think that kind of was the early stages of what I would experience and at the time I had no idea what it was went and saw a child psychologist and they said you have uh, got severe anxiety I had no idea what what it was, what it meant, but um, I guess more panic attacks and more uh, things down the road. And yeah. you played a lot of footy as a young fella, obviously. Yeah. So was it the case that a lot of that anxiety would go away when you were out on the footy field or were you always battling it even when you were playing? Yeah, I think uh, it was something that I would, I think when I was playing and when I was running, I was fine because I could just focus on trying to play footy and go and get the footy, and that was that was it. Simple. Yeah, that's it. Um, but then I guess when you'd come to the bench or uh, quarter time breaks or end of the game, start of the game, I'd still be quite nervous and quite yeah anxious of what's going on. But, yeah, I guess I when I was playing, I guess I did feel that kind of freedom that I could be somewhere else and some, someone else, I guess, in, in a sense as well um, with, with what I was doing, which I guess was a good thing, um, a good release. But may have masked things as well but um yeah i think footy definitely helped me with with that of just getting a bit of relief and release sort of thing how living with that anxiety make you view yourself as a young person pretty shy like i was a pretty reserved kind of person and not a lot of confidence other than i guess footy because that's all i knew and i just put everything into that yeah i guess that yeah confidence of backing yourself into do even simple things of going to the shops or something like that would be a, a pretty big deal did that feed into negative self-talk yeah definitely of i guess yeah you're going to make a fool of yourself or anything along those lines of yeah whatever that just to put yourself down while you're in that experience i guess while you're doing those those things yeah i guess i was a pretty reserved um young young fella and kept to myself a bit and still to this day I'm still probably still the same but um yeah i guess i've learned different things to handle those feelings those thoughts and feelings to yeah still be able to get out the house so yeah 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 and we know anxiety and depression are separate conditions but they often intersect yeah so what was what's been your experience of the depressive episodes and yeah it's the the main ones for me and it's probably coincided with the end of footy seasons which is looking back now and at the time i didn't really realize it but 
I guess I'd put a lot in of the ang- anxiety and, and a lot into the footy season that had come to the end and I'd just pretty much fall into a heap and be a regular occurrence at the end of the year. I would just lock myself in my room for a month um, and just sleep it off and then try and rebuild and go again. Um, Why would that happen? And would you be left with a hole at the end of the season and then you'd have all this time to have to stop and think? Was yeah. That sort of part of it? I think and just, I guess, burnt out and just mm. uh, like God. Uh, no distraction. Yeah, that's right. And and I would just sit in my room and, um, yeah, just sleep and um, just sit in, in my own little world and just let my head spin, which at the time I thought was the right thing to do to help deal with, I guess, my anxiety of you, you, I'd, I'd have anxiety day to day with going to footy or different things. So let's just have a month where we don't do anything, which in my head thought was the right thing at the time, but looking back, it wasn't. Um, and I was just suppressing everything. And unfortunately it came to a head um, at, at a, a later date, but um, yeah, I guess you, you learn those things looking back and um, yeah, hopefully I can, give some advice if someone's in a similar spot, they can see that and go, well, maybe if I'm doing the same thing, I can reach out and put things in place before. Yeah. How did it come to a head? Yeah. So 2019, normal, end of 2018, sorry, um, normal kind of finished the year and um, uh, I went into my hole again and um, yeah, normal process. And then um, be a start of pre-season. I, I, normally I'm, I get to that start of November, December, you're like, okay, I'm ready to go back into footy mode and world mode again, if you want to call it that. But uh, this one was a bit weird. Like I was hanging around and I was really, I was really tired. I was really second guessing myself uh, at footy. Even just talking, I noticed myself, I was stuttering a lot and uh, really second guessing. I'd say something and then I'd think about it for 10 minutes, which I hadn't done before. And I'd notice these little things and it got to, for maybe January, February, and I was really struggling. I was really struggling to leave home just for anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, it came down that I was in a, it was going through another depression and it was quite deep. And, yeah, I got to a point where I thought, well, there's no point. Like, I, I it's probably better that I'm not here in this, this spot anymore and take that pressure off my partner and everyone, and um, which isn't the right thinking and the right way to go about it. But, in that headspace, I just thought it was the right thing to do. Footy wasn't um, filling the filling the cup, I guess, which it was in previous years. And yeah, I was just really struggling to, to leave home and took time off work. I was leaving home maybe four times a week and that was to go to footy training um, in the afternoons. And that was it. Just sat in my own world for, for months. And um, yeah, unfortunately, a couple of pretty significant events that occurred. I yeah tried some things and um, unfortunately... Yeah, looking back, wasn't the the best thing, but uh, I guess in that time and that headspace was what I thought was the right thing to take away the the tiredness. I was just tired, exhausted. That was pretty much. I was yeah in a in a pretty dark spot, and yeah, didn't really reach out to anyone until I told my my partner Brooke, who's now my wife, that I was going through this, and she said, "I know, <laughs> I live with you. I, I can see this every day." And it wasn't until she said that she'd go to work and go to work and be anxious all day that she'd come home and I wouldn't be alive anymore. And she'd walk in and I'd be in the exact same spot on the couch that I was um, when she left at eight o'clock in the morning. It wasn't really to hearing that. And then seeing my parents after telling them uh, what was going on, how upset they both were. Dad's pretty um, solid, stoic, doesn't show a lot of emotion. And, and he was crying and seeing that the impact was like, buddy, hell, I'm, I'm in a really average spot and and really need to to do something about it which was reaching back out to the appropriate professionals and yeah trying trying what they um described and yeah that's that was it was a long process i still working through it now which was uh almost four years ago yeah it's a day-to-day thing what do you think caused you to check out to that degree like uh, where your now wife has gone to work and you're in the same spot all day and then you don't even really realise that you've just been sitting there doing nothing. Obviously, you've gone into yourself yeah. pretty hard. Do you, have you thought about what put you in that position? Um, I remember driving home from work one day and it was uh, it was would have been January um, and I remember uh, where I live, you've got to do a U-turn on the main road and I was just sitting there and I'd never had the thought before in my life, but I was just like, I just felt so tired and was exhausted. And I just thought, I'll just turn out here and 
what happens happens sort of thing. And that was the first time I thought it. And I, and I remember sitting in my car once I got home and, and thinking like, well, what was that? And I think I, I thinking about it was more, I was just, I was just so tired. I was, I was tired of going through the same routine in my own head of tired of being tired, tired of being as um, Mac Miller says, so tired of being so tired. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that, that really was, was where I was at. It wasn't, I didn't want to put any pain on anyone or anything. I was just, if this is what my life is, this isn't, this isn't great. I'm not really buying this sort of thing, which is a horrible way to, and a really selfish way to think about it. Um, but you just couldn't get rejuvenated. You couldn't get that rest. Yeah. That, and that's right. That's probably a really good way of, of putting, I couldn't get that rejuvenation sort of thing. And I just was in that real low spot for longer than what I had been previously. And yeah, I, looking back again, I probably should have recognized the signs and acted upon them earlier in the earlier years. But yeah, I thought I was doing the right thing at the time. So Were you not able yeah. to sleep much at that time? Yeah. So I was, uh, wasn't was sleeping. Because um, the thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So during that year, there was times I, I, we, we played a game on a Friday night and from the Wednesday to the Friday, I'd had about six hours sleep and I just couldn't switch off. And it was at Glenelg, which was close to where we live, and I walked to the, to the ground and walking home and I was hallucinating um, like there was shapes and colours moving in front of me and I was, yeah, and, and it was only when I got home, like I, I saw Brooke and she was like, I, I really shouldn't have let you walk home because I must have been gone for a long time and I even thought, I'd, like myself, yeah, I'd, I probably shouldn't have walked home because I could have walked out in front of a car and wouldn't have wouldn't have known. And when you're not sleeping, your brain can't repair and then you're yeah. going to be more anxious and all those symptoms are going to be 100%. amplified. 100%, yeah. I also felt pretty stuck though because I'm guessing you would have tried a fair bit of things to try and sleep. Yep, yeah. So I'd tried, I guess, the tablets and, and different things that were like prescribed to me. I never tried anything outside of what was um, prescribed. I did have one, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it was the next level up where we called it horse tranquilizer because it just knocked you out. But that worked maybe two or three times. And then after that, I was just wide awake still. And yeah, medications, unfortunately, um, never really worked. Tried maybe nine or 10 different medications and just haven't found the one that works. So yeah, it was a, a pretty average, I guess, uh, year of trying to find that mix to just try and get some sleep or try and get some rest and calm your thoughts. But um, what happened yeah. that meant you finally did get that rest? Like what, what did you turn over to be able to have a, a change there? I guess just the repetition of things that were good for me, which was exercise, it was good for me. And then speaking to the appropriate people, which I hadn't done and I felt pretty guarded of doing that. Um, so speaking to like Brooke and my parents and, and my family and my brother as well, and then two or three really close mates um, that I opened up to and we have pretty open conversations even to this day, which is about anything. But I think that helped. And then finally clicking with a professional as well. Um, my, I'd seen a yeah, handful of psychologists and went and saw a psychiatrist and really clicked with him. And he kind of reminded me of like a footy coach. He was just kind of direct of um, his feedback or what he saw and what he thought could help, uh, which I, I I guess resonated with because it was just direct and it wasn't, I guess, a roundabout way, um, which was good. And it, it, he also, like I, I spent two weeks in the Adelaide Clinic and I was really guarded about that and was really emotional and, and really scared of going in there. But it was probably the best two weeks looking back and the back, last week of being in there, I think I really enjoyed it because it was a really good reset. I saw him every day. It was just so good. Was it to... the case that the more you spoke about it, the less you had the dialogue in your head? At all times, yeah, was, in a sense, yeah, in a sense, I, like it still it was still there, but I guess I could talk to, um, poor Brooke. She copped a fair few, yeah, pretty weird combos, but she probably preferred that to nothing. That's, that's right, yeah, and, and I guess you hear what you're saying out loud of what's in your head, and you go, "Well, that doesn't really make sense, or that's not right," and then you can go, you can remind yourself of that, and then you can have Brooke say that to you as well, and like I, I. We, off, we had some really good open and honest chats of where we both thought each other was at, um, which really helped because, uh, again, it reminded me of it's obviously like I was going through the illness, but it was impacting 
her was impacting my parents and, and my friends as, as well. We all know physical health and mental health go hand in hand, and that's why Youngblood has partnered with Athletic Greens to bring you the benefits that can help with both. You might have heard of AG1, the one-stop shop nutritional drink packed full of everything you need to support your mind and body. Just one daily scoop of AG1 covers all your nutritional bases and supports long-term gut health with 75 vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, adaptogens, a greens blend, and whole food ingredients. Think of it like a cheat code to give you more energy, increase mental clarity, better sleep, and improved digestion, all while boosting your immune system. You wouldn't think mixing all those vitamins together would taste great, but AG1 is actually delicious and really simple to make part of your morning routine. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but producing the podcast is purely volunteer and I actually have to pay for studio time and editing. Every dollar we make from this partnership will go towards helping to cover production costs. So it's an awesome way to support your health, help the podcast and contribute to young men's mental health all in one. If you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash youngblood. That's athleticgreens.com slash youngblood. Check it out. There'd be a lot of partners out there that are quite frustrated and worried about yeah. the person they love and they feel like they can't get to yeah. get through to whoever that is. Yeah. How was Brooke able to do that with you? I think early days I don't think she knew how to and I don't think I knew how to talk to her about what was well obviously I didn't know how to talk to her about what was going for me but I think she showed a lot of courage and I'm really proud of her that she did she kind of just called it as she saw it the first time and and kind of just broke that wall down of what she saw and what she was feeling and she just broke down as well and I how, think how do you react to that uh I, I think it shocked me because I, I just you're just in your own world well I felt like I was just in my own world and I didn't think anyone really knew or I was impacting anyone because I just was staying at home. And again, it's a selfish thing because you don't think you're, you're really impacting anyone. And her, hearing her, uh, what she's thinking and feeling and seeing really helped me realize that as well. And I didn't, I don't want her to go through any pain with anything. So let's, I got to really do something to help help her and, and, and put things in place. And, and you can yeah. really get stuck in your own mind to the point where you can't, think about things from anyone else's perspective yeah. or even if you can it seems like it's sort of far away because you're in a lot of pain or you're really shut off yeah 100 percent. that then that's right i was just in my own little world of whirlwind of just the mind was racing and just trying to get through the day sort of thing or get through the next little period and it's probably the most dangerous place to be yeah yeah and but you, you, I guess, yeah, like you said, you, you just don't realise the people that it's impacting, especially the ones that you, you care about and they're so close to you. Unfortunately, you just didn't realise. So, yeah, hearing her say that and then we had regular check-ins where we would have a chat or we would we did one exercise where um, we'd go away for half an hour and just write down everything that we thought was going on and and what we were, like we were said, let's be brutally honest, like what you're seeing, what you're feeling, everything. Um, let's go away for half an hour, write everything down and let's come back together and we'll read it out to each other. And that was really confronting. But I remember once we finished, we went out for tea after we'd calmed down. Like it was, it was really good. Um, like liberating. Yeah. Like we, we became so, so much closer from it because we were able to know where we each other was at. And um, yeah, again, was really proud of her, of her, her, voicing those things and being brave enough to do it um, because I guess you could be forgiven to think that you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, especially in that space, but um, it was what was needed. And yeah, it was, it was really good. A um, couple of conversations that we had, um, which was, which was helped. Yeah. Yeah. So you've really made that a pillar of your relationship, like that level of honesty yeah. with her and, and yeah. your family and your friends 100%. as well, which, you know, you took that leap of faith. You could say where you were willing, to, where you felt like you had to, you did have to speak about this because it was obviously going down a, a path mm. that you might not come back from. But you still had to take the leap of faith to say, especially with your partner, you know, how's this going to go if I present this side of myself to the person that I love and I'm worried about how that's going to be perceived? Is is that all going to fall apart? And you had to take that risk. Yeah. And of course, like she does love you and just about everyone out there in a similar situation, they would much rather that than not Nothing. feel like they can't get through to whoever that person is, yeah. but still took balls for you to 
make that happen. Yeah. I, yeah, I think actually allowed the space and we, mm. we worked with each other. I think it was, yeah, a, a team team effort. But, yeah, I think it's just that initial conversation and it's different for everyone. Everyone presents in a different way. Some people might be more outward uh, where I was more stay at home, inward sort of thing. Um, so it's just, yeah, finding what the, I guess, the level is to meet them at and, and then go from there and, and hit in. Um, that's the fortunate unfortunate thing is that it's just not one size it's always different for everyone so yeah it's just i think if once you get that communication and that um the, the trust and confidence in each other i think is a, is a big thing yeah and of course you're a champion of a football player as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and humble um how's your identity been affected since you've stopped playing uh to be honest i've never i've actually enjoyed it that it's i don't like i I would love to go watch um, Sturt play more often, but I don't want to go back there. And um, it sounds horrible, but I really struggle talking to people. I just want to go and watch the footy and that's it and go home. Why do you reckon you struggle? It's just probably that social anxiety of, of those things and, and people wanting to talk about. Um, Is it because you know you'll sort of be a bit of a centre of attention there and lots of people come and talk to you? And... Uh, maybe. <laughs> I struggle to say that, but yeah, potentially. But I think. Uh, yeah, I guess I have had that experience where I've gone and that has happened. Um, so I guess if I just don't go, then that's fine. I don't need to to worry about it. I can just uh, yeah chat to the, the boys after. And that's I'd, I really struggle saying that because, um, yeah, I'd love to go and watch more. But, yeah, the I guess the identity, like I, I never really bought into... The superstar. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I never, that, that never really bothered me. Like I, I would be more than happy to not have... Um, yeah, people come and talk to me. I don't know how to word it, but... Oh, you're yeah. more of a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I think the thing I've struggled with most is uh, having the something to strive for at the end of the year, which was to win a premiership. That was all I ever wanted to do and each year and having something to work towards week to week and then have that end goal. And I think I've, I've done a lot of research um, with a lot of different athletes. Like Steph Rice has been pretty open about her with with her swimming and winning gold medals and that helped seeing that that is a, a normal thing. But um, yeah, I think that's the thing I've really struggled with is that competitive side. I don't get that anymore. I've taken up coaching, but that's not quite the same as the physical playing um, sort of thing, but that's just where it's at and I have to learn to, to deal with that sort of thing and find another way to. Have you got a it's... different physical outlet? I run <laughs> a lot more, yeah. which is probably not great because I just had, back surgery at the end of last year and so it's been a slow process and I probably can't run as much as what I could previously but um that's probably my outlet at the moment yeah but it's yeah because you've got to have something don't you that's right yeah, yeah. and something to, to work towards and there's a few things that I'm working towards with that but yeah I guess that footy goal of the premiership and working in a team environment and seeing your mates four or five times a week yeah, there's not much that really compares to that and that's something that I'm still working through. Um, I've been retired for two years now and mm. I'm sure it'll be longer But um, and a lot of people go through it, but it's, yeah, finding what something to fill the hole sort of thing. How are you using, how are you using your knowledge of mental health with the team you're coaching? Uh, I'm pretty new with the team I'm at at the moment, so um, I've had a few conversations with players, but nothing to the level, um, I guess, um, of like, sharing it with everyone which I'm more than happy to like, I'm yeah, happy to share my story. Um, if it helps one person, um, then it's, it's absolutely worth it. But yeah, I think if, yeah, anyone ever from there needed the support, I'd be able to, I guess, help point them in the direction that they need or, um, yeah, help them seek the appropriate person or if they just needed any advice of, we might have similar experiences and um, obviously everyone's is different, but there might be something that I've experienced that may help. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty open with that um, if, if anyone ever needed it. And even opposing teams um, reach out of a player that might be struggling and what would you do and things like that. So that's what it's all about is, is helping each other and sport's good, but we're all in it together sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's the kind of culture we need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're a dad now. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Little Benji. Yeah. Little Benji, little man, yeah. Uh, how's taking on that responsibility impacted you? Because yeah. that's the big one. Yeah, it's been great. I've... I've loved it. It's been um, obviously an adjustment and there's a lot of things that happen that 
that changes, but it's it's been one of the best things um, I've ever experienced. And unfortunately, we had a bit of a rocky start where he had to spend extra time in hospital because of a few illnesses. But um, he's he's back fighting now and screaming the house down, which is a good sign. So, but no, I've loved it. and it's given me, I guess, a new perspective on on life as well. Um, and then I guess seeing what Brooke went through for the whole nine months and then the birth and then after, yeah, you really do appreciate what mums go through and, and um, yeah, what, what the, it's not just the, the, the birth and then that's it. It's, it's a lot more that comes after that. And yeah, he's uh yeah, he could, he could be a little rat bag for a whole day and then he gives you one smile and everything just washes away. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty special. Yeah. How, how has it changed your perspective? I guess things that I've probably stressed on and worried about prior to, to Benji coming along, I, I probably don't, give that too much time now because I can't because there's, there's not that much time to do it. But he's the, I think seeing him in hospital and after he was born and how much it impacted Brooke more, more so. And then wanting to make sure that she's safe and then make sure that Benji's safe. Um, I think those little things that I've probably stressed about, I just, they're not real problems that they are, but there's bigger problems sort of thing. And that's making sure that he's healthy and safe. And yeah, so I guess that, that kind of uh, mindset kind of shifted for me and um yeah taking yeah. that attention off you yourself you know of someone else in the world now that's fully reliant on you yeah yeah does that help yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i think like, i'm not really doing much at the moment <laughs> i'm just giving brooke a glass of water when she needs it and when when he needs it at two o'clock in the morning and he's screaming and brooke's tired and you, you go and change him or go and walk him around um downstairs or, or something like that that's just those times like we've been up at Last week we were up at two thirty watching the basketball, and I loved it. And I stayed up. We stayed up all day, all morning, and I thought it was was great. Um, and I was tired for the day, but then I thought back of like we were just sitting there watching the basketball, and he was happy as Larry, and had no idea what was going on. But I really cherished that time, and yeah, it, it was great. Yeah, good time for the playoffs to be on. It is. Yeah, <laughs> not so much for my Cavs, but we won't talk about that. Yeah, that <laughs> uh, how often do you wake up feeling anxious these days? Yeah, still quite regularly and still something that I, I deal with each day, I'd say. Um, there wouldn't be a day where I probably don't have an experience of um, whether it's in the morning or early on where that's happening. And, and, and I know that's going to be my life uh, because that's just who I am and that's my makeup and that's fine. It's about, for me, catching that and working with it. There's been, in a way, been a lot of positives that have come out of it as well. How do you ground yourself when you... Well, when you wake up. Yeah, f- for me, it's being active and just getting out and doing something, whether it's a walk or a run or just something. Um, there's obviously times when I don't and I just don't feel like it and, and that's okay as well. And it's not beating myself up that I didn't do it, um, but I know that it, it's good if I do. And I, f- I found a really good thing now where I park, like work in the city, but I park outside of the city and walk in. And that's just a good thing for me that I look forward to it because uh, I might be feeling really cloudy coming to work but once I walk into work I put the podcast or music on and just tune out and then get to work and I feel like a different person sort of thing so, so that movement for you is massive yeah yep yeah, 100% yeah that's I, I identified that early I guess in 2019 when I had that that year of um, trying to find what works and and that was something that that worked for me when medication wasn't I would go out and run and move and that would be good for me are you still seeing a psych not at the moment. No, uh, I did reach out to one um, at the start of this year through different wait times and different things that didn't work out. And um, I used a telephone line one and that was good enough. That was a good support for a couple of weeks. And then I felt like I was starting to trend in the right direction. And that was around the time that Benji was going through hospital and different things. And yeah, just trying to I guess get that outlet and that support from a fresh set of eyes that was outside of the circle i guess you feel like you've got that culture around you though with your support network yeah pretty well created that or they have as well yeah you're going through what you've gone through and definitely having those conversations and yeah hopefully and it seems like it's not like oh we just talked about how i used to feel and at the time when things were really bad and then we stopped doing that it's kind of like Continue. Once you open the door, it's sort of open in a good way. Yeah, hundred percent, and and it f- flows both ways. I think I've found with the people that I've I've spoken to is that we can have that two way street of if they need to talk about something, they feel like they can as well, which is which is good. So, 
and that um, helps you too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you feel comfortable that if I do need to reach out to someone, they're there, and and it's it's that comfortable. You don't, you're not mm. burdening them. That's a big part of it. Is you don't want to put anything on someone. They've got their own issues, but if you've got that just that open conversation, it's it's good. And mental yeah. health has actually become a really big part of your life, which you probably wouldn't have ever seen coming. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought. But yeah. it's your work now as well. Uh, yep. with Breakthrough Mental yep. Health Foundation, what do you do with them? Yep. So yeah, you're, you're right. I, I didn't think that I would be uh, working in, in mental health. I, I would wanted to stay as far away from it as I could when I was, I guess, experiencing different things before, I guess, that year. Um, but yeah, now I work in the community engagement is my title. And so work with um, sports clubs, businesses, people fundraising for the charity um, that want to get involved. I kind of deal with them and then do mental health first aid training. So I train up people in that um, and then also run different, I guess, sessions, awareness sessions and things where people can come along and, and learn and have a chat and, and different things like that. So a variety of things, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah definitely not what I thought I'd be be doing, but um, it's it's great and it's, it's working for a, a really good cause. And yes, obviously something that I'm very passionate about of, of helping. If I help one person, that's always been my thing. If one person takes one thing, then it's all all these uncomfortable feelings of talking about yourself is worth it. That if one person can take a, a bit of advice and feel like they can talk to someone or whatever, that's that's what's all all worth it, sort of thing. So yeah. What have you seen come out of that? Uh, as in people like those sessions you've done, and anecdotally, people that you've come across yeah. through, through that work. Yeah, I think it, it, you can see, especially like in country uh, sports clubs, you can see they're pretty guarded. They come to the the footy club, which is their safe place, and they're coming to a mental health session there's still that that uh stigma or that wall over it and so they're a bit guarded but then i guess seeing after two or three hour session the conversations that that come after it is um we had one in kangaroo island actually that was uh, they've had a, obviously the bushfires and a lot of trauma there and yeah a couple of years later the conversations that they're having at the end of this session where at the start they were silent um and then after that they're, they're talking about that how they feel like they can't talk or things like that and hugging each other, which they wouldn't have done at the start. Like it's, um, yeah, you see that and it's, it's pretty, um, pretty powerful, pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. Cause then it stays that way as well. That's right. To a degree you have to yeah. keep doing it. But once you've had that breakthrough, yeah, so to speak, <laughs> yeah. then you're probably going to have that dialogue afterwards or hopefully, especially men in particular are going to tap each other on the shoulder after or check in and, yeah. and not feel like, oh, I should be embarrassed about this which yeah. is really the best that we can hope for and that's slowly going to change culture over time. Yeah, and, and through some of the activities that we do, I think you can see there's a, a part where we have people that if they feel comfortable, they can step forward to if, they, if they've if experienced something or they can put their hand up if they've experienced something that we're describing and I guess they can see, oh, shit, that guy's gone through the same thing that I've gone through and I can feel comfortable talking to him because he might have the same experiences sort of thing. And you can see that kind of slowly over the two, three hours um, break down. And then hopefully when you leave, they can still have those conversations because they've seen that guy's going through the same same sort of thing. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of young blokes out there playing footy or whatever sport it may be then they only feel comfortable when they're on the field or they're on the court. How can they change that? I know everyone's different. Yeah. Uh, what are some some basic things that, that you'd say? Yeah, and that's the 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 beauty or the the average part of it is that it's just so different for for everyone. And um, for me, I was just stuck in seeing what other people were doing pre game or trainings. And when I was younger, and you see the senior guys do that, so I have to do that then. And as I went along, I guess I, I was like, well, no, that's not really working for me. What can I do that works for me? And like some people would listen to real pump up music and get really jacked up before the warm up, and there was times where I was meditating and almost falling asleep right as we we're about to start the warm up, and that was good for me because I would just calm everything down and would put like a self talk or like quiet music on and just really mellow out, and then go into the warm up, and I feel like I could flick the switch from there to the game mode, and I'd be I'd have more energy or wouldn't have played the game before I'd run out, sort of thing, and. Yeah, I think that that really helped me of finding what works for me rather than what I'm seeing other people do because they've probably done the same thing um, of doing, yeah, what, what works for them sort of thing. And 
Um, like I've had panic attacks during games and um, yeah, like I had to work through that and just breathing on the bench, just taking it back to that of the head trying to put his arm around me and just going through breathing techniques and I'd have a towel over my head wrapped, wrapped and um, just trying to work through it and half time at the end of the game, I'd go lock, get locked in a room and just work my way through it. But yeah, it's finding what works for you at that time and that day might be different week to week as well. So it's finding what where you're at and what works for you, I think is key. Thanks for continuing to share your story, mate. I don't know if you've been doing it for a while now and it's still not something that's comfortable. <laughs> and like we said, you're a behind the scenes guy. So yeah. having a bunch of cameras pointed at you and talking <laughs> about this stuff, which is the toughest thing you've been through. I appreciate it. it's not, not easy, but it certainly does help one person, if not more, or definitely more. Yeah. Really appreciate you giving your time to do that, man. And to continue living the way you're living and being an example that you can you can change your perspective and you can change the way that you're adapting and thinking about yourself and and being able to come forward and and I suppose not not judge yourself too harshly along the way as well and actually yeah learn to love yourself and and your own quirks in a way and mm. yeah let other people come and put their arm around you and 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 then do it do the same for others mate so yeah, yeah. good on you thanks mate thanks for having me that's it for this episode. If you like what we're all about, support us by following Young Blood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Young Blood Mental Health on TikTok. And if you're already following, we'd love to get you more involved. Keep an eye out for our regular community question time posts on Instagram and drop a comment with your answers to join the conversation. Every podcast episode is recorded in professional quality video and they're all up on our Young Blood Men's Mental Health YouTube channel. So please show some love and subscribe. Thanks to our local business supporters, Heard Financial. You can find everything there is to know about the podcast at youngbloodmensmentalhealth.com. And most importantly, please share these stories with anyone in your life who needs to know they're not alone. We're all in this together. Catch you next time.